it seems like what we can start with today is uh, one of Euro Asia Pacific's flagship programs, uh, the Global to Local. And what what was what went behind the planning of Global to Local, and what what do you think Global to Local achieved? Global to Local was something that inspired the very setting up of Euro Asia Pacific. Although Euro Asia Pacific was uh, started in 1993, the first Global to Local was only in 1997. But it was an awareness that the CEDO was uh, obligations under CEDO undertaken or not undertaken by governments um, was being reviewed at an international level uh, and women from the countries at the, from the national level were not present to um, present to the CEDAW committee their issues directly was a concern that made us start Euro Asia Pacific. We said we'll start an Asia program, Asia Pacific program for this. Otherwise, international NGOs like uh, the Euro Minnesota was presenting international reports at the international level, and there were other international NGOs like Amnesty and all that. And nobody wanted to start the national program, so we said we should start a national program. But we could not do global to local the year we started because we needed to build up. Uh, our knowledge and awareness of the significance of CEDAW and motivate women to work with CEDAW before we could bring them to an international process. Uh, so we took three to four years to do that at the national level. That was where we did all those ground level orientations on CEDAW on equality and capacity building and all of that. By 97, we said we were ready to get women to come into an international process with what we were then calling shadow reports, where they would bring their own issues directly to the committee. And the committee was very receptive at that time for women from national level to come. And they preferred to hear from women from the ground, on the ground rather than only listen to an international uh, presentation of what the issues were. Although they did listen to them also, but they would give preference and priority to the national uh, groups. Uh, the committee had made a, res a resolution, all the committees for the, for example, uh, treaty bodies, that they will start listening to national level views as a priority. And Euro Asia Pacific and this under the CEDAW review was about the only uh, non-governmental organization that facilitated this. Uh, and brought women into the review process. Um, and we thought that this would enable women not only to present their issues directly, but that they would have a better understanding of the standards that the CEDAW committee was interpreting uh, from what was said in the text of the CEDAW. Uh, and uh, understand CEDAW better, understand equality standards better, uh, as international universal standards and would take it back to their own countries to challenge their governance and draw accountability. Uh, because when women were not there from the national level, uh, international NGOs were presenting good reports, but they were not in a position to go back and challenge national level governments. They really had no standing to do that. Uh, and, but women from the country, as citizens of the country, had that standing to challenge their governments. So this that was why we called it global to local, bringing it back to the national levels and drawing accountability. So that I hope hope answers your question of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, it does. Um, I have two follow up, two follow up questions to that. Okay. One would be, you know, this was also at the same time. This was clearly an important step in realizing state obligation yeah. and from the very beginning Euro Asia Pacific has stressed on state obligation as one of the fundamental uh, elements of working with yeah. with CEDAW yeah. so this this was definitely uh, contributed to that but what made 
you go expand in a way your outreach beyond Asia Pacific because this was okay. also a decision to yeah. do that. Because when we started in 1997, there were only two Asian countries that were reporting to CEDAW uh, in January when we started. And that was Bangladesh and Philippines. These were the only two countries. So we didn't think it was worthwhile for us to do a big thing like this uh, for just two countries in Asia. So we felt that the effort to give an orientation and bring women from other countries wouldn't be very much more of a burden, mm. uh, except the logistics of it. Uh, and therefore we said, why don't we open it up to other countries so that more countries that are reporting will bring. And we are glad we did that because one of the gains, I'm going to just jump into one of the gains that we had was a regional exchange of information about equality and non-discrimination as it occurred on the ground. And we could see the universality of inequality in uh, every country. Uh, so this was a big gain for us because people learned across the board from different countries uh, the challenges that women faced in uh, trying to achieve equality for themselves. So both national and inter-regional inter and international exchange took place because we opened it up. And, and obviously that exchange must have included uh, sharing of strategies of, of how to, yes. how to confront or counter discrimination. Yeah. But the sharing of strategies as much as could be done uh, at that level. You know, one of the things we did during the early global to local was we all stayed in the same hotel. We arranged for everybody to be in the same hotel. So we could always speak to each other in the evenings and after work hours. But we also rented one extra room in the hotel. We rented an extra room, uh, which was like a common room uh, that everybody could drop in whenever we they wanted. Uh, instead of just meeting in each other's rooms, but we it was this one extra room. And after the day's review, people would drop in and chat and compare notes, exchange uh, strategies and do all that. Yeah. So did, it did, did, did this translate? Uh, did this translate into a kind of solidarity between the participants? Did some of them continue to link with each other? As far as I know, we created uh, a listserv, which was called a global to local listserv, and we and was only it was a closed listserv. It was meant only for participants who had attended the Global to Local program. And our intention was that people will, after they go home to their own countries, they will continue to exchange views, what they did when they went back home uh, to, to um, implement some of the concluding observations, strategies for all of that. Uh, but from my understanding and awareness, nothing much that exchange didn't place up, take place after they went home. Because one of the things I saw, that solidarity at the national level existed when they were preparing the shadow report. So many different groups, we encouraged them to do that, to come together, to form a common platform, and uh, develop uh, the content of the shadow report, identifying priorities and uh, weaknesses of state action. They did that. So that happened at the national level. When they came to the international level, the solidarity continued at a regional or even international exchange did take place. But my own view is when they went back, each of the of the groups 
uh, I didn't do any kind of a serious um, study to understand this, but this is my observation only. Uh, each of the groups kind of fell back into what was their organization's agenda mm -hmm. originally. You know, for some it was violence against women, for some it was nationality, it was whatever it was. As for some, it was even violence was not just broad violence, but communal violence, uh, you know, and they just, or some law reform, some uh, struggling to bring in a domestic violence law, they just fell back into that original agenda and pushed hard for it as part of the zero accountability. But they did not, in my view, really come together on a maintain that common platform. Uh, before going to global to local, the glue that held them together was the need to prepare a shadow, common shadow report, a collaborative shadow report. When they came back, that was no longer a motive. I felt that even at the national level, solidarity didn't take, didn't continue. Although there was follow up action, but not in that kind of there was no, no real solidarity in my view. But yeah. perhaps it, it, it resurfaced during the second reporting and the third reporting and the fourth reporting. Do you think that no, happened? Really, yeah, this is my concern about global to local. Although there were further cycles, the same pattern repeated itself. They did go into coming together to do the next shadow report, but they came back and I didn't see that solid solidarity happening. And when they came back, the same, it was global to local, in my view, is more or less a repetitive program today. Uh, and uh, for me, that is, uh, I, I, I am again saying that I cannot make this uh, ob a very categorical statement. This is my observation. I'm not closely following what is happening, but this is what I see. And uh, part of my concern today is that uh, there's no longer that one collaborative report. I have uh, gone into the CEDAW review maybe two years ago before the COVID and all that. And I see like five or six issue-based shadow reports coming from countries. Uh, but put this, together? But put together? No, 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 no. They are separate shadow reports. Issue separate based, submissions. Separate submissions. Separate submissions. Separate reports, separate reports. Many organizations, you go into the web page of the Office of the High, CIRO web page, and you will see, you don't even have to go to the CIRO review in, in Geneva. You will see many NGOs listed and their shadow reports listed. Uh, and they pick up certain articles of CIRO and they write and they're writing their shadow report. Of course, there's more uh, in-depth understanding of the issue but that original intention of having that solidarity so that since they came together to write that report, when they go back, they will have a platform, a common platform from which to then negotiate with their governments. That is, has not happened. And that potential, there was at least a potential. I don't see that potential anymore. Mm. But out of, I don't know the exact number, but definitely more than 100 countries have now participated right 140 countries already yeah okay so that's a huge number that's a, that's a, huge that's number. a big part of the globe um, you see, there is a difference i want to say this also there's a difference between then when we started and now and that is when we started even in 1997 zero was not very well known to to, to women in the various countries Asia was a little better placed because of the four years of ground level work that you and I did on the ground on CEDAW. But other countries that 1997, suddenly we brought them in, into the reporting process. Uh, and they didn't have that preliminary orientations or anything on what CEDAW was. So CEDAW was new to them. And one of the things we, one of the activities or initiatives we encouraged in other countries that didn't have that same orientations was for a lead. There was always a lead NGO. Hmm. And we told the lead NGO, 
to go around the country and give just before they write the shadow report for uh, maybe within a six month period, uh, do orientations on zero to the women, various women's groups and gather data mm. on various articles. So that, they did that and that created already a solidarity on the ground. But today, everybody knows CEDAW. Mm. So there is no need to bring them together before writing the shadow report. You just suddenly call for the writing of a shadow report and each one brings their own issues. And now they're beginning to be dissatisfied that uh, a common shadow report uh, may not address their own issue adequately. In fact, something that has disturbed me in recent years of the writing of the shadow report, which essentially I also viewed as an activity which could foster solidarity, which could uh, foster common understanding and, and contribute towards a longer term platform against discrimination. So a non-discrimination platform. So it's not just about this issue or that issue, but a broader. And that hasn't happened in Bangladesh either. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. But what has happened in Bangladesh, which is even more disturbing, is now we have consultants who write the report. True. So, and and okay. even the UN agencies are contributing directly to the undermining of that solidarity between women's organizations ah. by paying consultants. Uh, and, then, and then just having a, a, a kind of um, a meeting where the consultant will present it to the women's groups and say, okay, now everybody likes it, so we can submit it in the name of the women's groups. So this is, it. I find even more insidious, but what yeah. to do now? <laughs> you see, uh, that is very true that um, solidarity, that platform for non-discrimination and equality is what I hoped eventually, not just issue-based platforms. Right, right. Yeah, but a common platform nationally and maybe regionally and even globally to have an equality coalition, a non-discrimination and equality coalition. I hoped that would happen into which themes would fit in. Right. When you, when you want to then push for some change you contextualize that change within an issue. But you start with that ideology of equality and inequality and have a coalition that pushes that. Um, I had hoped for that, uh, but in my epilogue of the history <coughs> that I have written, I have mentioned that, that we created uh, what did we gain as zero? What gains did we bring about as zero Asia Pacific? One big gain was, I say, we created CEDAW literates. <laughs> People know CEDAW. Yeah. We have yeah. we created uh, a whole lot of CEDAW literates, but we did not get them to come together on an equality non-discrimination platform or a coalition, whether nationally or regionally, we did not. We were um, not able to. And my understanding now is that creating that is a major task because people want to hold on to their own theme because it gives them an identity. These are the land rights people. These are the indigenous rights group. This is the indigenous rights group. It gives them a color of who they are. And while that is important, I'm not saying you can give up the context, uh, but to overlay it with the question of equality and that to say we are equality people uh, blurs that distinctive identity. And people are not willing to give up that uh, thematic identity. Uh, and donors subscribe to this also. You know, donors also want to know what is your theme. 
So to break that and create this uh, coalition of equality people takes a lot more time and a lot more motivation, a constant promoting it, constant promoting it. And it takes a lot more time than I was at Eero Asia Pacific. Mm. Uh, because that was my vision. It did, uh, that vision didn't catch on very much to anybody else. So that is part of the problem. And my view, that's part of the problem. So anyway, mm. this, this is where it stands. Let's talk a little bit about the other games. Well, for example, and these are gains that I have gathered from the evaluations that people, evaluation forms that people filled. First of all, because we brought in women from various countries that had not gone through a process of understanding equality as prescribed by CEDAW, one of, we, we managed to bring in until today, perhaps about 140 uh, women from about 140 countries. They, we created this understanding of equality for them. Although we brought them to write, the, we helped them to write shadow report. We gave them, when they came into Geneva or New York at that time, we gave them orientations on what was equality under CEDAW because they didn't know that, so, uh, we, other than just the processes of the review. So they began, most of them wrote about how wonderful it was for them to understand substantive equality, so that the standards, the international standards of equality and non-discrimination is uh, something that was a very big gain for women from more than 140 countries, number one. Number two, since they sat and watched their governments being grilled by an international body, they recognized they now have power. It was the power of watching. One of the women actually said this to me. It was the power of watching their governments under international scrutiny and knowing that their governments knew they were being watched by their women. That gave that altered the dynamics of relationship between um, uh, the women and the and, the, and their governments. For example, I remember a Costa Rican uh, woman saying um, that uh, she says now Costa Rican authorities know who we are and that upsets them. So they propose dialogue and inform us about their plans. They get nervous. <laughs> but this is, did the opposite also happen anywhere? That the governments actually became more hostile? Myanmar has threatened their NGOs. Uh, in fact, um, that's also part of being nervous. Uh, in 2016, actually, much later when uh, uh, Myanmar was uh, reporting and there were NGOs from there who were in Geneva. While the NGOs were in Geneva, Myanmar police raided their offices in, in Myanmar. So people from Myanmar immediately informed the NGOs in Geneva, your office is being raided. So they informed the CEDAW committee and during the review, CEDAW committee openly confronted the government delegation and the ambassador and said, you cannot do this. Because there is also a resolution by the uh, UN that you cannot uh, uh, penalize anybody who participates in a UN activity. Mm. Uh, and then the, the ambassador immediately, ambassador who's based in Geneva, immediately said, no, he will get in touch with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and make sure that nothing like this is uh, uh, like this will happen. Uh, so then the other thing is by watching the governments, they are able to understand, uh, have a better nuanced understanding of their government stand on the various issues and, and the ideology of the government. 
And this is interesting because when I said there is this regional and international exchange, um, it takes place, as I said, the universality of inequality is not only in developing countries and poor countries and Asian and African countries. This inequality as an ideology uh, exists even in the more developed countries. And I remember Finland, when it reported and the government was talking about violence against women in Finland, and there's violence in all these big countries that are at the top of the gender equality index, like the Scandinavian countries, there is violence occurs just as much as in your country and my country. And, uh, and when they were being questioned, Finland replied, they create an, as one of the Finnish women said, they realize their government was creating a symmetry between different forms of violence by saying women too are violent. Uh, and the greatest problem in Finland is violence between two males. The Finnish government during the review said this. So this woman said, when we have a review afterwards, we kind of assess how did the review go? She said, I realize the government is creating symmetry between various forms of violence. They're not distinguishing gender-based violence as a form of violence. They're making it all the same. They obscure gender-specific issues in violence. Uh, and, and they obscure uh, a value base which would allow for efficient action against violence. So sometimes some of these women, when they speak, because they actually sit there and watch what their government is saying, they come out with real uh, assessment, which astonishes me how the language they put to it, you know? So the Finnish woman said, my word, this is what I see my Finnish government is doing. You know, and I've never heard this expression of symmetry between various forms of violence and downplaying gender-based violence as an issue by itself. Mm. So this is the gains here, when they actually see what the government is coming out with when they, uh, when they uh, speak. Uh, and uh, so these are some of the gains that are made. And, the, the program, the global to local program, in my view, has much potential because of all of this. If only there is more leadership in molding this uh, into more of a solidarity platform. And this exchange of views uh, of how the Finnish government looked at violence our understanding that this is similar to what ha will happen in our own countries as well, however underdeveloped it may be. Uh, and therefore, the solidarity is easier. You know, we are all same at the end of the day. Our, our challenges are more or less the same. Um, that potential is there, and I hope there is still possible for that potential to be uh, mobilized. Uh, but as I said, you have to give a space and a possibility for women themselves to do the analysis of their governments. They, they do it with passion because it is something which affects them. Not, it won't be the same if an expert or an academic sits there and does a review. That's my view, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so women are shocked sometimes. And they come up with an analysis which is very, very enlightening. Uh, and if we can build on that, um, and that it, it, I feel the potential for creating that solidarity platform is always there.